let me close uh, with a story, and then, then we can open it up for uh, uh, some questions. I want to return to my friend Ray Gagne. Um, uh, Ray wrote a, a, an autobiography about his life, and I mentioned to you that often when he was alive, uh, he would go with me and he would tell his story as part of this. And when he passed away several years ago, um, I decided that one of my roles in this life is to continue to tell Ray's story because um, more than anything I think I can say, it's the experiences and words of people like Ray that we really need to listen to and to pay attention to. So Ray's autobiography, says he starts out, he says, My name is Raymond J. Gagney. This is a true story. I was born January 10, 1945 in Attleboro, Massachusetts, and I am a person with cerebral palsy. Ray lived, again, at a time prior to a lot of the protections afforded through civil protections like the Americans with Disabilities Act. He wasn't eligible for public school because uh, he, he, he became uh, school age before the advent in 1975 of uh, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. He says, my mother, mother felt there was something wrong with me. She took me to many doctors and hospitals to see if they knew how to help me. And they told my mother I would never walk. You will hear people, if you talk to, to the parents, and fa parents of, of young children with intellectual and developmental disabilities today, you will hear them tell you that a doctor at some point along the line said, you ought to just institutionalize that child. He'll never have a quality of life worth living. He'll never walk. He'll never talk, yada, yada, yada. You know, it, it was very prevalent in Ray's era. It exists today. There are more physicians who know better than that, but it's amazing how those kinds of, of expectations uh, continue. Ray, in fact, did learn to walk. <laughs> uh, and yet, you know, so, you know, they were given the prognosis of hopelessness from the onset. Uh, by the medical community. But Ray, you know, Ray has good uh, memories. This is talking about the eight years of, at home. He says, I used to sit in a rocking chair next to a yellow window, and, you know, these, these were good times. And, but he also talked about how important school would have been. You know, there was no school for him. And he really felt left out. He felt less than a person because he had been excluded from our educational system. And as there are attacks on equal education for kids with disabilities, I want you to remember, IDEA is a civil rights act. It is not just regulation. It is a civil rights act that said every child in this country deserves a free, appropriate public ed education. And when that begins to be attacked, then we're heading down the road the, definitely the wrong way. So he, he says, there's no school for me. So but, but Ray, as Ray got bigger, his mother had more difficulty handling it. By his own admission, he began to act out. He was bored. Uh, they had to carry him up and down the the steps. Uh, he, his grandmother was getting older and they were having all sorts of health problems with her. So like many people of his era, Ray was uh, taken to the institution uh, and his family had no other options. Our society provided no other option other than to continue to struggle with that or, or, or go to the institution. At the institution, he says, after arriving at the state school, the inaptly named state school, there was nothing educative about institutions in that era and very little educative about institutions in this era. After arriving at the state school, I was put in building seven, home sweet home. You become just a number, a part of the system. You live in building seven. Every morning we would wake up at six. An attendant would wake up when why six? Some magic notion? They weren't going off to work, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> it wasn't like they had to be anywhere. Shift changes dictated, you know. You had the one shift going off in an hour, and they needed to get people up and get them dressed so that the next shift could do breakfast. And, you know, the, the system demands other determinism. The system demands dictated what they were doing. Got up at six where they wanted. He put on clothes that somebody else picked out and laid out for him. I didn't have any say about what I wore. He says, the staff never seemed to prepare me for living outside the institution. Very low expectations. Why? Were these bad people working? I mean, you know, no, these were good people wanting to help, but you become, you become to some degree a victim yourself of the system and the expectations in those, in those places. I've worked in an institution. I know how that happens. People who you originally had very high hopes for disappoint you in what their expectations for people are. 
So low expectations. They didn't seem to think I would make it on my own. Up until the age of 14, I wasn't allowed to go to school again. Uh, Ray brings it up as a critical issue. Then Ray moved out. He moved out because somebody, uh, somebody told him that they thought he could live in, their, in, the, in, a, in a halfway house kind of thing. Somebody said, Ray, I think you could do this. And that's what it took for Ray to get out. He says, the day I moved out, some staff told me that I would be back in a month. How's that for low expectations? He says, they may still be waiting for me to come back. Ray had a very dry sense of humor. Um, that same year, I went to Washington, D.C. by myself. This was the first time I had ever done that. Imagine that. You've lived in an institution for people. With, you know, stark, un, uh, uninviting environments and, and you know, the, the juxtaposition between the nation's capital and these. And think of the experiences you can have wandering around D.C. compared to the experiences you can have in, in Building 7. You know, there ain't a lot going on in Building 7. I've been there, I know, you know. So he says, during the fall, I moved. So he was in, a, he was in this kind of a halfway house uh, that they, they moved folks into. He says, during the fall, I moved into my own apartment after a counselor at a camp for people with cerebral palsy taught me all I needed to know to live independently. Now, wait a minute, let me reread that. After a counselor at a camp for people with cerebral palsy told me she thought I could, a second person in Ray's life communicated their belief that he could do this. And that's what it took. Ray didn't have the skills he needed. Somebody said, Ray, I believe in you. And maybe that's the most important thing we can do in the lives of people like Ray and Ruth and the people that we interact. We can say, I believe in you. Let's go see what we can do to make it happen. So um, he says, you know, he's out there uh, struggling for power. He says, I learned about Section 504, the Rehab Act. Uh, and help found a self-advocacy group. I learned the skills of leadership, advocacy, consumer organizing, and assertiveness by watching people, participating in group meetings, and asking questions. My ability to communicate my ideas and to facilitate work toward changing the status quo developed over time. Ray learned what he needed to know by doing it. You know, a lot of what we have to do is we have to get people with disabilities engaged in their lives and let them learn. Obviously, there are some circumstances where we want to be careful that there's, you know, we're not pu putting people in positions of risk. But that's, that, you know, that, there are so many things we can do uh, that can teach people about themselves. And, and you know, he, he, he was developing uh, his, his ability to communicate both you know, his own verbal skills but also having something to say. He says, uh, unlike the staff at the institution, the human services professional I met in, in this job, he got a new job, treated me with respect. Here we go again. Respect, dignity, value, worth, rising expectations. They gave me a chance. How do they, how do they treat him with respect? He defines that for us right. They gave me a chance to contribute my input and feedback. Point one. We treat people with respect when we give them a chance to have input and, and we engage them and we, we put them in circumstances where they have a voice in their own lives. Secondly, he says, and they believed in many of my ideas by listening to people and saying, good idea, let's go do this. This is what you want. What's your preference? What, you know, what do you want to do? Um, and finally, they adapted the working environment to help uh, me communicate with them. They made the modifications, the adjustments to the environment. Capacity, environment, fit issues. Ray concludes, he says, I wrote this story to let people know what it was like growing up in an institution from the 1950s to the 1970s. And there were horrific things in Ray's life in the institution. His teeth were pulled without the uh, benefit of any type of anesthesia. He was sexually, physically, and emotionally abused by staff and other uh, people who lived there. He had horrific experiences. What stuck with him? What does he put in the last paragraph? He says, the total lack of power in making decisions about my life. Not all that abuse stuff. That was horrible. It was the total lack of power in making decisions about my life made me angry and I was treated as an outcast. I feel that what has happened to me should never happen again. And what Ray's talking about there is not just institutionalization. We should shut. We can. We know how to do it. We know how to shut institutions down. We know how to support people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the community. We know how to get them real jobs. We could shut down every shelter workshop in the country today if we had the willpower. Um, but what Ray is saying is it's more than that. It's about 
with, about being treated with dignity and value and worth and recognized for that. And that fundamentally is, is what self-determination is about. So, I've talked enough. Why don't we turn it over and have some questions? One of the issues that you know, just strikes me every time I hear you talk about that is the, the variables that affect somebody's access to self-determination, like social confidence. I mean, Ray putting on the suit with the banker. Somebody, the way that somebody dresses is, you know, markedly changes the way somebody reacts to them. If I want to go in and advocate for my parents, you rarely will see me in a suit and a tie, but I would put on a sport jacket and a tie when I had to advocate for them at doctor's offices. I mean, these are really, really critical kind of variables. How do, how do we pick up those cues? Yeah, and, and you know, um, we talk about problem solving as a, as a, a component of becoming more self-determined, but the truth of the matter is, if you think about it, self-determination always has a context. It's self-determinism, self-caused action, versus other cause action. And almost always the other caused action, the other thing wanting you to do something else or uh, imposing its will on you is another person. So being self, and these issues of problem solving are often issues of social and personal problem solving. And, and they come into play in relation to how we, uh, learning the skills that enable us to navigate the complexity often of, of human interactions and to understand the circumstances, like uh, Dr. Calkins was talking about, when a certain way of acting and presenting yourself uh, may have a different impact to achieve your goal. Again, there's a broad goal-focused issue here. Uh, Ray knew that he needed a checking account because he wanted his goal was to live independently, and so he um, um, he, he needed he needed to get in that suit. He needed to show. Uh, in a way that was socially acceptable to those people in the bank. So these issues of social uh, competence are really important. Not that, I think, again, uh, you'll know, you know, having gone through what I've just went through, it's not that you have to be socially competent to be self-determined. It's that the more we enable people to be self, uh, socially competent, the easier it is for them to achieve the kinds of uh, self-determination related outcomes. And so it, I, I think a lot of the things that we do, and I, you know, I think we, we you, know, you know, in a lot of fields we, we give a lot of lip service to social skills, but we never contextualize social skills in, in ways that are meaningful. We really, we don't, you know, we want people to acquire social skills but not just for the, 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 you know, that narrow, you're a socially skilled person, so that they can apply those social skills in ways that enable them to be more socially competent, which in turn enables them to be more socially included. Those are the outcomes we want. We want social competence and social inclusion. We get there by some focus on, on, on skills. We talk some in our work about issues of social capital. Uh, a lot of us don't have the, the same high profile platform that can get us uh, everything we want in life. Uh, but if we're fortunate, we might have somebody around us or near us or who we know who, can, who does have a higher profile, has more social capital, and can get things that we're not able to, uh, uh, to get at. So, you know, uh, and people with intellectual and developmental disabilities rarely have the opportunity to make the kinds of friendships and to make the acquaintanceships where you can say, oh, I know somebody who, and then you can pick up a phone and say, would you do me this favor, and da 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 da, da. So, uh, you know, we, we need to really focus in interventions that promote and enhance self-determination on, on these issues of the social context, enabling people not only to acquire more social skills, but to be able to use those in ways that enable them to, to become more socially competent, to enhance social capital, and then ultimately to become uh, more socially included. George. Um, as you, I'm sure, know, there are several cultural groups, both in the U.S. and outside of the U.S., where decisions are, um, or actions are family-caused. 
and that's for all people, whether it's with or without disabilities. And so how do you see self-determination playing out in a situation like that? And I think it becomes important in the U.S. because we have several of these groups right. here. And that's a really good point. And, you know, I've heard, I've heard people from minority groups talk about self-determination as if it's something the majority is trying to force on them or it's, a, it's only a Western European value. And, and my response to that is that, uh, first of all, if you look internationally, there is a focus on issues around the self-determination of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities all around the world. There are, you know, and, and in a wide variety of contexts. I've, I've had the, the opportunity to speak to people in South Korea, in Italy, in Spain, in, in Europe. You know, it's, it's, uh, there are people working on these issues in virtually every country in the world. So that tells you there's something that, that goes, transcends just one particular cultural issue. And I think what we have to do is we have to peel away the onion that is how self-determination is understood. It's, uh, you know, at, the, at its core meaning, it's this notion of self-caused action. And if it gets layered with all these other things, if it begins to mean a, uh, not only self-determination, I mean, uh, making a decision, but a particular way of making decision, that's when the, the confusion has. So, you know, th there's a lot of work, in, again, in social work and social welfare around the application of self-determination in, in uh, context in which decisions are made by, uh, say, elders in, in, in a community. Um, we've worked some with the Diné Nation and, and had a former doctoral student who looked at a lot of these same issues. And it comes back to understanding there is, if you look at any culture, there are rituals, there are uh, experiences that go with being, moving from being uh, uh, a child to a young adult. The, in, in development psychology, this is called the individuation process. You move from being largely dependent upon others to being largely dependent upon yourself. And that's where these issues of self-determination play out. And there isn't a society in the world that, that doesn't have some rituals and, and process around that individuation process. And so um, I'm convinced. And, and so what we have to do is we have to back off and we have to say, uh, and we have to remove the notion that, that teaching self-determination skills means you teach one way to make a decision or that it is even, you know, making a decision. Uh, it, 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 uh, you know, if you look at, uh, 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 switch an example a little bit, uh, people all the time make the decision to enter the military by their own choice, their own volitional action they have chosen to enter the military. Now, when you go into the military, you are getting, you're giving up some of your own personal freedoms. You know, I mean, you are going to be in a, an environment that has other people telling you what to do, when to do it, you know, kind of like Ray's institution. <laughs> you're going to get up at 6 o'clock, you're going to be breakfast, you know, and th there's those types of things. You're giving up what we might call kind of those personal freedoms, but again, you're acting volitionally. You're making choices that this is what you want to do and that it serves your longer term goal around that. So it's important that we not equate self-determination with a single way of solving a problem or making a decision that I, I believe it's relevant across contexts and but what we often need to do is we need to we need to, to figure out what kinds of interventions and supports are relevant to that context and and focus on that and that's the biggest mistake we try to to take you know um, a, an intervention that was developed in one cultural context and just apply it in another context, and that often doesn't work. One of the things that you could do, um, and we'd really be receptive to this, is we have a website, but if you have questions about self-determination as you reflect on Mike's lecture and some of the challenges, um, if you would just send me an email about those, I'd really appreciate it. We're trying to build a body of knowledge that can be passed on to social workers, psychologists, other workers in the field. So if you don't have something today, that's fine. But if you had some questions, just send those to me and we'll put them together. Can, let me just ask you, can you see ways in which these kinds of ideas are relevant to what you see yourself doing in the lives of people in the next 
several years whenever you've, you're, you're finished with your training. Are these issues that you think are going to be out there that are going to be something that you'll have to address? I think they will. I, you know, these are issues that are, are relevant in the lives of a lot of people, particularly people who, who might be needing supports at some level. And, and you know, I, I would encourage you to think about, even if you're not working in a disability area, these ways of thinking about human beings, these, these notions of people as disabled because they're broke, you know, there, there are similar models across other types of peoples. Uh, and people of different experiences, you know, and, and these kinds of uh, ways of thinking about capacity and context and, and the empowering effects of promoting and enhancing self-determination, I think are relevant for a wide array of people.